<laughs> you have no great you have an examination with your doctor. But the, the European method, the European method is primarily a lecture, and you attend a series of lectures, after which you take a very high stakes examination. And your, your graduation depends upon how you do on the examination in major fields within the curriculum. So, the American system often uh, feels to European students as much easier than the European method. But then when they go home, they find the European method to be boring, frankly. Okay. I'm not sure why Mr. Williams couldn't get here in time. He got here in time and then left. Not pulling a chair out of money, but... Yeah. All right. So... Today, we have two assignments that we're going to do. First, I'm going to give to you what you should do. I'm going to demonstrate for you what you should do at the beginning of the first affirmative of every Parley debate. I will just demonstrate that for you. You then will have the opportunity to respond to my demonstration. And it's a chance for you to practice being the first negative, because you don't know whether you are the first affirmative or the first negative. Then we will have a coin flip for Monday, and then we'll have a quiz. And when you finish the quiz, you'll be able to go home and go play Halo 4. <laughs> all right, so the resolution for today is this house of verse. We have all the answers. It is the will we lack. And as a first step in our debate of this resolution, I need to define for you each of the terms involved in our resolution so that we might have a debatable resolution. Are you, are you right now being the affirmative? I am the affirmative. Okay. I, I am the affirmative. Is this Professor of the affirmative. This is not the quiz. You will be doing what I am doing as the quiz. Does the wife want Okay. Are you with me now? Yep. Yeah. Can we go ahead? All right. This house of verse, we have all the answers. It is the will we lack. And the first thing I want to do for you this morning is define all the terms in our resolution. Hope everything came out all right. All right. This house of verse, we have all the answers. It is the will we lack. First off, this house. By this house, I mean the Lutheran heritage of Bethany College. Avers, by the verb avers I mean, alleges it to be so. Third, we is all human beings. We, all the answers, in this case, I will take to mean, we know what we should do for the planet. Finally, it is the will we lack, I wish to define as, we are concupiscent. That is, we persist in sinful behaviors, one of which is our misuse of the stewardship of the planet. And I want to connect this then to the religious tradition that we find in our three remaining areas of study. First of all, uh, to the Christian faith presents compelling reasons for sustainable living. Just to say that again. This house is the Lutheran heritage of Bethany College. Avers is alleges it to be so. We is all human beings. All the answers. We know what we should do for the planet. The will we lack. We are concupiscent. That is, we persist in sinful behavior. Contention number one. The Christian faith has as one of its core principles the doctrine of original sin. By which we mean, traditionally, that all human beings are curved in upon themselves, as Luther said, curvatus in se. We are self-centered and unwilling and or unable to accept a divine source for all goodness. We confess each Sunday within the Lutheran tradition, also in the Episcopal and the Roman tradition, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. In other words, we are and remain sinners, even though we have been washed clean of original sin, or however you wish to formulate that, we are, it is inescapable that we persist in our sinful behaviors. Contention two, the Christian scriptures begin with the divine uh, 
the divine giving responsibility for the care of creation to the creature. Genesis 1.28, we read that God says to his creatures, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Often subdue it is taken to mean beat up on it, take over it, make it do what you will. But in fact, that verse must be, must be balanced with the verse from Genesis 2.15, in which we read that God put man in the Garden of Eden, quote, in the Garden of Eden, to till it and keep it. This fundamental doctrine within Christian, within Christian ideation has always been known as stewardship. It could just as easily be known as conservation. In other words, contention three, we know what to do. Our knowledge is imperfect and it must be supplanted as we grow. But we do know the basics, and we have seen the consequences of the misuse of our stewardship. And I point you here in this context to the great Dust Bowl of the 1920s, in which the farmlands of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Nebraska were decimated by drought and bad stewardship. It wasn't simply that we underwent a drought. We are undergoing a drought now that is equal to or worse than the drought of the Great Dust Bowl. But we have exercised our stewardship better in the land so that we aren't living with great dust clouds. We don't plow, we don't till, we don't keep the earth as we did prior to the 1920s. So therefore, we have the answers for what we should do. But it is our sinful nature that keeps us from doing what we need to do for the planet. Okay, that's my contentions, that's my, that's my case. Take some time, write it down. <clears throat> Take some time, write it down. Be ready to step up and speak. Relevancy or, or simply a rational approach. What is a rational approach to, to Bible quoting? We could go on Bible quoting one after the other, but if you can't develop it into a systematic sort of, of, of defense of Scripture or a defense of faith, just Bible quoting gets you nowhere. <clears throat> because as Mark Twain observed, you can, you can find just about every, anything in the Bible, even the truth was noted for these kinds of things. So the criteria of rationality has to be invoked. As you're, so if somebody quotes something for me, just because they quote a contrary source doesn't mean that you just go back and forth quoting sources. It means that you've got to find a rational basis for dividing the one from the other. So I, I would need to present a rational basis for considering this, these quotes from Genesis 2 as being somehow definitive for Christian faith. So I'm gonna, I've got more work to do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, I, and it has to be presented in such a way that you as audience can understand it. If I, if I jump out of some Lutheran theological bag that I learned in seminary, you gonna get it? No, so I can't do that. It has to be there, but I can't jump out of that bag. I gotta, I've got to put it in a term that you can get because you're the audience and I have to convince you, okay? Hmm? Or related to. Now, what about what about the third contention? The third contention. What do you want to do with that? Well, to me, I thought you compared the dust bowl to now, but there's so many differences between then and now. It's hard to compare because we have more better technology, more okay. resource availability, and just sheer more population. Right. So you want to say things are different. Things are different. Because we were talking about, we have all the answers and we know what to do, but it's the will we lack, so... Uh, yeah, but the thing is, we're talking about knowing what to do, but we, right. we all we sin anyway. Right. So instead of using the dust bowl, I feel like using something like uh, taking something from a candy shop or... But see, that's something a... Something really unethical. That's a, the dust bowl was something we couldn't control. Oh, yes, we could have. We could. There was no reason well, for the Dust Bowl. In the argument as I've said to you, as I said to you in my argument, we are experiencing a drought 
now that is equal to or more than what they experienced in the Dust Bowl. That was almost 80 years ago. Yeah, and they didn't have the technology. So. They had the technology. They just chose not to apply it. So then, if you're saying... So I, I could, if I expand upon the reasons for the Dust Bowl, I think I can convince you that it wasn't a matter of technology. Okay, so you were trying to say, like, we're, our sins aren't, like, we're not sinning as much and we're doing, because we're doing more for No, it. I'm trying to point out we know what to do. No like, and no. we knew what to do then, too. But we chose not to do it. So we had sinful nature more so than... Huh? I, I, mean, I can cite you. I can cite you agronomist experts from the from the period. Okay, and you can do that even after you. Well, I wouldn't want to do it. I would do it in my in explaining my in okay, enlarging my contention. Because I gave I just gave you the bare bones of the contention. Okay. okay. Although, could you argue though, since we have more population now that we have more people? If they had that same population, then they, more people would have known what to do. No, because it was, not, it was not a question of knowing what to do and even more people knowing what to do. It was a question of what we chose to do, which was to remove the prairie. We removed the prairie. We took away all of the grasses. We deep plowed. We, we, we cut furrows where furrows should not have been cut, and we knew they shouldn't have been cut, and we knew there was going to be problems, but we did it anyway because we had a boom going on with lots and lots of land giving lots and lots of bucks. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. Have you okay. ever been to the Land Institute? Pardon me? Have you ever been to the Land Institute? Yeah. But that yeah. prairie that's never been cut? That's yeah. Cool. yeah. And that's the point. That's the point. We knew not to do that, but we did it anyway. We knew that. We knew that there were going to be consequences, and we did it anyway. So you could argue that, or like we could argue that at that point we didn't know we thought because there was a boom, we could take more and do That's more. right. And then and that's now, now we have learned from our mistakes, so we're still well, on the right path. No more left to We've learned from our mistakes. But, but as I would develop this contention, I would, I would develop the idea that we haven't learned from our mistakes. And in fact, what we saw in the economic recession is in fact exactly a sign of concupiscence. So it is our we, sinful nature that keeps us from doing it. So could we bring up how, like, you're saying that our sinful nature keeps us from helping, but there's, like, the Red Cross helping Sandy? And like out in Sandy and you could you could bring that up. Is that gonna is does that con does that contradict the notion of a sinful nature? That's what you gotta get at. Okay. What's the key issue here? The key issue is are human beings by nature sinful and unclean? And that's where you want to go. Don't don't chase the peripheral issues though you'll be chasing them forever. Are human beings by their nature sinful and unclean? And I'm saying yes they are, and you have to say No, they're not. It's that simple, guys. Go for the simple. Go for the simple. Now, how do you support the idea that we're not sinful and unclean? We point to the altruistic works. What else do you do to show that we're not sinful and unclean? Well, I guess kind of going off of Jess, you could talk about like um, just the blood drive that we did a couple weeks ago. Exactly. So you can, you can point out you point out the altruistic things that we do. Sinful and unclean people don't do altruistic things. What else can you do? What else can you do? Can you point to anything within, because this is a debate about the Christ, does the Christian faith have the resources for sustainability? What else can you do with sinful and unclean? Well, you can, I mean, because you're, you're sort of arguing, I know, deep, right? You're arguing that you're, you're arguing that we're sinful and unclean, so we, can't, we won't be sustainable. But you don't necessarily have to argue the simple and unclean thing. You can argue that we can use the simple and unclean to our advantage to make the Christian faith sustainable. Okay, how would you do that? Uh, altruism doesn't exist, but the Christian faith can bribe members of the church or make them think that the only way to get to heaven is by being sustainable. Seems somewhat cynical. <laughs> well, it does seem like, and, and I think you're opening up yourself to well, questionable... In the rebuttal, I certainly would attack that as being unethical. Oh, unethical. And manipulative. Those, yeah. those are just what my grandma calls me. Come on. <laughs> Do you, 
If you spit on the ground, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> exactly. You toss that paper out there, young man, a hell of fire awaits you. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't give it the blood drive because, because we, we're altruistic. We give it the blood drive because the Red Cross annoys us or because it makes us feel good. Or <laughs> free t-shirts. Free pizza, free t-shirts, free pizza. Well, <laughs> there are incentives. There are so sticks and carrots. But some of us don't want the incentives. Either way, there's no unselfish act. Yeah, it's it's at the very at the very oh, least. You guys are so warm. cynical. It's that, okay, we can be cynical, but it's not bad. Selfish doesn't have to be a negative. It's that warm and fuzzy feeling inside is the reason you if you didn't get that warm and fuzzy feeling, you wouldn't do it over again. Possibly, but that no, that's a psychological you didn't get that warm But that's feeling. but you're proving my point. We are we are in fact concupiscent. Okay, that's we do right. not do what God requires of us, which is to keep until the garden. We, in fact, will only keep until the garden as long as we get rewarded for it. But God never said, keep until the garden and I'll give you heaven. God said, keep until the garden. Period. That's it. That's the end of it. That's what you're supposed to do because God said to do it. But when you keep until the garden, you enjoy the fruits of your labor. Yeah. And but he didn't say, that's why, if you do this, I will, even if you don't keep until it, you, you enjoy the fruits of someone's labor. In fact, God said, here's all the fruit trees in there for you. As much as you want to argue that the Bible gives us all the answers, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say the Bible gives us all the answers. Go ahead. Regardless of what God says, <gasps> the institution of religion has brainwashed this idea of incentives. You do this, you get to heaven. You do this, you go to hell. Well, actually, okay, that's, that's good Catholicism. Okay. It's not good Protestantism, but that's okay. okay. Well, another thing is you... We're not supposed to sin, and though we do, but then there's the talk of a merciful God and how he forgives us and the debate of grace and everything. So you're getting into a lot of really... Certainly you're, certainly you're getting into complicated things, and that's the point of debate. I know. Oh, expose and open those complicated things. Okay? Do you have some idea of what you do? What the affirmative must do is exactly what I did. Define the all, <clears throat> excuse me, define all the terms. All the terms. What do you mean by? The negative then should focus on the important ones that are debatable. And as you saw, I did bring a case that was debatable. You were more than willing to debate it, which is fun, which is exciting. <laughs> You can, I can feel my blood getting pumped up as we, as we get into these issues. It's, it's exciting. That's what we want, is we want the excitement. You also can, remember, pound on the table. Rabble, rabble, rabble. Here, here. Uh, it's jolly good, whatever. Cheap, shame. Those are all within your, within your purview. But the key is, the beginning is the... First affirmative must de must define so that we have a debatable case. Okay, so we have one versus.